the blood is there to stay. The wind may blow and the rain may fall, but it just won't wash away. The blood will stand the raging storm. It's been applied with loving care. Stay secure, you can rest assured that the blood storm and left behind a flood of endless questions and doubts had filled my mind then a fear that gripped my troubled soul took me to my knees in prayer saying father will you please go look and see if the blood still there. chapter number one tonight thanks again for being here <clears throat> i was talking uh <clears throat> talking in the four year there before service and you know when you go through when you go through situations you really just got to rely on the lord to to do what you feel like the lord wants to do and i uh i'll be honest with you this morning when that happened my heart was out there i, wa I wanted to be out there i wanted to be with the family and, and help them um and so i, I believe that i believe the lord was honored in what we did in the service this morning and uh, but I am grateful that you're back tonight because I do have a message on my heart and I hope that it'll be something to encourage you <clears throat> in the scriptures tonight. Ruth chapter number one, we're going to begin reading in verse number six. Once you find your place, go ahead and stand. Uh, <clears throat> now, I'm, a, I'm, I'm happy this evening because um, I got two really good looking members of our family over here and they're not seated on this side, they're seated right here. <clears throat> And it's good. I'm glad Corey and Charity and the kids are with us tonight, and it's a blessing to see them. And uh, so I, we've been we've enjoyed a little bit of time this afternoon, and haven't got to see the kids much, but uh, but we've enjoyed a little bit of time with them. I'm glad they're here this evening. The Bible says down in verse number six of Ruth chapter number one. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in that in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited His people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return into the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to, their, to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. <clears throat> Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods, Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where, where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part me, uh, thee and me. 
And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Let's bow together for prayer, and after I pray, you can be seated. Father, once again, we want to come before you. God, just to say thank you, first and foremost. Thank you for being God. Lord, thank you for being good. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for salvation, God, that's full and that's free. God, because of a great payment that Christ made on Calvary. Father, Lord, thankful. Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that even in a dark day, God, the blood is still there. God, I'm grateful that in a dark day that sinners can still be saved by the grace of God. God, Christians can still be purified, dear God, by repentance because of the blood of Christ. And so, Father, I pray today, Lord, that we'll worship you. Lord, I pray, God, that the message that you've placed upon our hearts tonight, God, I pray that it's the message for the hour. I pray, dear God, that you'll help hearts and help people. I pray that you'll help to clear my mind of the things of this morning. God, clear my mind of things of tomorrow. God, things of later on this evening. And I pray that you'll help me to be able to focus on that which I've studied. God, I pray, dear Lord, that you'll have your perfect will in this service. I pray that your word would be magnified. God, guard my, my mind, my lips, and my, and my tongue, my mouth, God, that I may say, God, only that which is that you'd have me to say. God, I pray that, Lord, nothing's done in the flesh. I pray, God, that you'll help us tonight. And, Father, Lord, just do your perfect work. God, would you please do the work in the hearts of the people that are here tonight. God, maybe one that's lost tonight. I don't, I don't know the hearts of each and every individual that's here God may be young, may be an adult, doesn't know, I don't, I don't know, but God, you know the need there. God may be one that's uh, backslidden, God, and there's one that's just not close to thee. I pray that tonight will be the night, God, that you'll help them. Father, there may be one that's uh, kind, of, kind of straddling the fence, and Father, Lord, they're, they're not in, and they're not out, or maybe there's a draw to them to return, God, to that which you've delivered them from. And I pray tonight, dear God, that you'll do a special work in their heart. God, maybe some tonight's praying about the will of God. Lord, I pray that you'll help them. Uh, God, those that's facing difficulties in life, I pray that you'll give them grace and strength as well. Lord, I pray tonight, God, that most of all, you'd be lifted up. God, your name could be exalted. God, for you are worthy. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the praises, the good testimonies that we've heard. And God, we pray that you continue to work, God, in hearts and lives as well. Thank you for all that you do, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Here we read a familiar account of, of course, Ruth and Naomi, and they're, and they're leaving Moab. Uh, most of us in this room, as I look around, probably very familiar with the story how that uh, Naomi and her husband, they went out into Moab. They left uh, Bethlehem, Judah, and they went out to Moab. Uh, there was a famine, dark days in the land, difficult times, and they decided they was, wasn't going to stick it out there in Bethlehem, Judah. And they went out into the country of Moab. While they were there, uh, their, their two sons married two daughters of Moab. And uh, long story short, come down through time, uh, Naomi's two sons had passed away. Her husband died, and it was just Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, and, uh, and they decided now they're going to get out of Moab, and they're going to make the trip back into Bethlehem, Judah. And uh, there's a couple things that I want us to notice by way of introduction, and I'll tell you what I believe the Lord would have us to preach upon. On reading verse number 19, now we stopped at verse number 18, but I want to read verse number 19, and I want you to listen to this. The Bible said, so they went until they came to Bethlehem. Now do you see what that says? Where are they at, class? They came to Bethlehem. They came to Bethlehem. So it's clear uh, by reading verse number 19 that at this point in time, they are now out of Moab. When you come to verse number 19, they're out of Moab, and it may help us to understand the significance of getting out of Moab. Moab, just to give me a little, uh, just a couple little background things, little simple things you may already know. The Moabites were known to be enemies of the nation of Israel. Uh, when you read of the Moabites, they're, they're enemies of the nation of Israel. If you remember, uh, you remember there was a man, he was the king of Moab by the name of Balak. Remember Balak, he hired a man by the name of Balaam to pronounce a curse upon the Israelites. You know where he was at? They were there in the land of Moab. The Bible goes on to tell us in Joshua 24 and verse number 9, it gives us a little rehearsing of that. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel. And sent and called Balaam the son of Beor to curse you. Hey, so the Moab, the Moabites were enemies of Israel. They were no friends. They were no allies of Israel. Uh, I, and I'll go somewhere in just a minute. Moab was also the child of a sinful, incestuous relations between Lot and his eldest daughter. Remember when Lot and, and his family came out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, they went out and, and his daughters got him drunk, both of them. And, and long story short, they both had children by their own daddy. And that's, that's how Moab started. The, uh, Moab was the, was the son of the eldest daughter and which the Moabites come through his lineage. And I'm telling you, they were, they were the product of sinfulness. They were the product of wickedness. And uh, Moab was a wicked place. You can go to Genesis 19, 37 and read of that. And according to our text, Moab was a land 
Uh, and also to the book of Judges, Moab was a land that was filled with false gods. If you remember when I read, the Bible said that Orpah was going to go back and return unto her people and unto her gods. That's a little g. She was going back, so it was a land of paganism. It was a land of idolatry. It was a land of false gods. And so Moab, uh, it's very easy for us to depict Moab as being a very worldly, a very godless place. Uh, you know, that, and there's, you know, talking about Moab being, you know, the wash pots of Moab. I mean, Moab was not a, a pristine city that you would, that, that would have much of appeal or much of a draw to you. Moab was a place that really the people of Israel just shouldn't have fit in with. Moab was a place that the people of God really didn't belong to be in in the first place. But I want us to see this as Moab is a type of the world. You know, they were enemies of Israel. May I say to us tonight, this world, uh, regardless of how we paint it, regardless of what we are told about it, regardless of the images that we get in our mind, this world is no friend to Christianity. This world's not your friend. We, we preach that to our young people all the time. The world's not your friend. But I believe we'd be well involved to preach that to our adult people because the reason our, world, our young people are so caught up in the world is because mom and daddy are so caught up in the world. Right? It's because we're okay and we, we don't guard them and we don't protect them and we don't do what needs to be done and we allow them to go up. Listen, the world is not your friend. The world is not a friend to the people of God. The world is filled with sinfulness and wickedness and godlessness much like Moab. The world has its own gods that it lifts up. The world has its own things that it'll, that'll put up before God, whether it be that of entertainment, whether it be that of uh, pleasure or that of leisure, whatever it may be. But the world, again, is a, uh, or Moab, rather, is a type of the world. Hey, listen, can't you remember those of us who are saved when God brought us out of Moab? Hey, I'm grateful for the time I got saved by that blood that they were singing about. And it brought me out of that proverbial land of Moab. God saved my soul, and I was born again, and He brought me out of that wickedness of a place that we know as the world. But you know, there's people that are still living in Moab. There's people around us that still live in that Moab. They're still living in the world, and they've never come out of Moab. And certainly we would preach the gospel. We would tell them, listen, Jesus is an answer. Uh, there's heartbreak, there's heartache, and there's trials. And we understand there's heartache and heartbreak and trials, whether you're saved or lost. But the difference is, is when you have heartbreaks and heartache and trials when you're saved, you don't go through those things by yourself. The difference is, is you can find yourself on your knees and you can begin to have that relationship and call out to God and God hears you as children and God has the ability and the power to meet those needs. But there's a lot of people still wandering in a place known as Moab. Sinners or citizens of it, if you will, that's still in need of a Savior. But tonight, I don't necessarily want to talk about that crowd of people. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, listen, I want to tell you something. You need to get out of Moab. If you're not saved, you need to get out of Moab. There's nothing good in Moab. There's nothing promising in Moab. Moab was a place of temporary. Moab was a place of temporal uh, sustainment, but it was not a place of a permanent satisfaction. And I'm going to tell you something. This world can offer you a little bit for a little while, but there's no permanent satisfaction in this world. You need to get out of Moab. You need to come out and allow Christ to deliver. Listen, there's hope on the other side of Moab, but you've got to get out of Moab. But I want to talk to us tonight from a different standpoint. And I'll say this. You may have a testimony and say, Preacher, I know the day. I remember the time that God saved my soul. If you would, I remember, Preacher, when he brought me out of Moab. Well, the question tonight is this. You may be out of Moab, and I want to know tonight, is Moab out of you? You may be out of Moab, but is Moab really out of you? You say, oh, preacher, that's not possible. If I'm saved, I can't go back to the world. Oh, listen, my friend, that may sound good, but that's just not true. That's just not true. You can choose to live how you want to live. You didn't lose the ability to be a free moral agent when you got saved. I didn't lose my ability to sin in my flesh. I didn't lose that ability. I didn't lose the ability to do wrong, to choose to do bad deeds. I didn't lose that ability. No, listen, I just had somebody move in that will help me to guide me through this life. So you're out of Moab. So preacher, I'm saved. That's all taken care of. Wonderful. But is Moab really out of you? Believers are given clear instructions in our Bible. Romans 12, 2. What's it saying? Be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. Now that's talking to saved people. Saved people can be conformed, molded to the image of this world. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 1 John 2.15 teaches us this, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, uh, uh, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father 
is not in him. Love not the world. What that means is, is listen, you may be brought out of the world, but you better make sure that the world has been brought out of you. Love not the world. We, we live in an hour to where I'm, far, I'm, I'm too convinced of this. There's far too many believers that are in love with this world. They're in love with the world. You can't find them involved in the things of God. You can't find them involved with the people of God. You can never find them in the house of God. They don't read the word of God. They don't pray to God. Listen, what is it? They're in love with the things of this world. They want religion. They want, they want, they want a guilt-free life, but they're in love with the world. They want the, rid- the religion to look like the world and sound like the world and act like the world but still feel good about having a religion. They're in love with the world. Hey, listen, they don't want to sacrifice their time and service to God because they're in love with the world. Their priorities are different because they love the world. Their practices are different because they love the world. And so tonight, listen, you may be out of Moab, but is Moab out of you? Here's, here it is in a nutshell, believers, those of us who've been saved. I want you to really ask your question, is Moab really out of me? Is it really out of me? Now, I will say this. I, always, I believe that Moab is something that you're always going to have to continually knock down. Continually knock down. You may not like to admit this, and you may, you may be really too spiritual to want to say it out loud, but there are things about this world that you like. I'm talking about not good things. I'm talking about not things that you'd put out to tell everybody that in your super spiritual Christian outfit that you'd want anybody to know, but there's things in this world you like. You know why? Because you're flesh. You're flesh. I'm flesh. There are things that we like, but I'm going to tell you something. It's something that we are always going to have to battle. Always. We're always going to have to battle to make sure that Moab is out of me. I want to give you this illustration, and I'll look, we'll jump in the message tonight. You know, there is a danger of not getting Moab back. You say, well, preacher, listen, I believe there's enough room for me to live, uh, to be saved and still have a, leave a little, little Moab in me. <clears throat> you know, I, we joked a little bit yesterday. I, I'm from West Virginia. I make no bones about that. Uh, there might still be a little hillbilly in me. I, I, I come out of the hills, but the hills may not all come out of me. And I'll just be honest with you, I think there's room enough in the South for both of it. I was born below the Mason-Dixon, so I crept in under the threshold. But when it comes to your Christian life, there's no room for both. But at the end of the day, guess where I live? I live in North Carolina. I vote in North Carolina. I'm concerned with what goes on in North Carolina. I'm concerned with the area around where my kids are growing, or where my kids are being raised, and where my kids were being raised, and where my grandkids are being raised. You say, why is that? This is home. Hey, there was a lady in the Bible that's mentioned that we know much about just a few chapters earlier. As a matter of fact, we called her husband by name just a moment ago, Lot's wife. And we know the account of Lot's wife, right? When they're leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, experiencing the judgment of God. And they're leaving, and everybody knows what happened to Lot's wife. What happened? She looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. Now listen, there's a whole lot of preaching. There's a whole lot of speculation. I'm going to tell you this. I don't know why she looked back. Oh, preacher, she's wicked. She loves Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know that's what it is. But I know this, there was something in Sodom and Gomorrah that she left that never come out of her. Hey, might have been a brokenhearted mama because she had children that died when the fire fell in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, maybe at that point she was a grandma. And as a brokenhearted mama with tears in her eyes, could not believe that her grandchildren she'd never see again. And as the tears come down her face, she just wanted one more look at those that she loved. Now I'm telling you, before you throw rocks at her, you better understand, it's more difficult to get Moab out of you than what you might think. Sometimes it's difficult to get Moab out, but Moab's got, there's no room for Moab. There's no room for Moab, but you see the danger, uh, regardless of the motive, you see the danger in Lot's wife as she never got Sodom all the way out of her. She was out of Sodom, by the way. She was out of Sodom, but Sodom wasn't out of her. Notice a few simple things that we try to answer this question, is Moab out of you? First of all, I want to give you some good news. The good news is, is it can still happen even in wicked days. It is possible to live without living under Moab. It is, you say, well, preacher, I've been, I've been set aside, but I just don't know how I can get the world out of me. I mean, preacher, it's bad, bad, dark days. Well, we find here a lady by the name of Ruth. And may I tell you something? Ruth got out of Moab, but I also believe Moab got out of Ruth. Go back to verse number one of the book of Ruth, chapter number one. The Bible said, now it came to pass, look at that next phrase, in the days when the judges ruled. That's pretty simple, right? 
In the days when the judges, you say, preacher, when was the setting in the book of Ruth? In the days when the judges ruled. Now, we understand those type of days, right? Those were, those were kind of roller coaster days for the people of Israel. But most, the most famous thing you can think of in this book of Judges is every man did that which was right in his own eyes. I mean, that's what comes to my mind when I think about the time frame, the historical time frame of the book of Judges. And here's what I think about. People say, well, preacher, it's just too bad for me to even try to, to live. I'm doing the best I can. That is a total cop-out from God's people. That's a total cop-out. If Noah can live for God in the wickedness of the day, it's a cop-out for you and I to say, well, it's just too hard. If Ruth, a Moabitess Gentile, can not only come out of Moab, but can get Moab out of her in the day that she lived, it's a cop-out for God's people to say, well, it's just too hard. This happened in the days of Judge. I'm telling you something right now. She come out of Moab, and Moab came out of her in some of the darkest days for the people of God. Some of the most fickle days. Let me say it that way. Because that, the, the roller coaster ride of the nation of Israel in the book of Judges Carnal, wicked, godless people. They'd serve God for a while and they'd turn. And by the way, you can find much mention of Moab in the book of Judges. A very big part, a lot of that that they went through was because of the persecution of the Moabites and the influence of the Moabites. But it was a wicked era for Israel. When you see this to Ruth, how did she, how did she do that? How, preacher, how are we going to, you say, well, it, it's possible, but how are we going to do it? I want to share a verse with you. Go to 1 Corinthians, if you would, tonight. Keep your place. We're going to be back in the book of Ruth. But I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. We're going to, this is going to be really simple tonight, but I want, to, I want you to read one verse. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 7 tells us this. He's dealing with wickedness in the church, by the way. If you remember not, a couple years ago, we dealt with 1 Corinthians 5 pretty extensively. We dealt with sinfulness in the church and what it was like to, to have sinfulness. And there was a time in, in a church that, that a church had to take a stand and a church had to make their stand to do what's right. There's a time that we can't just wink at sin any longer. We can't just accept it and excuse it and to learn to live with it. That's the problem we're having in our churches today. That's the problem with churches in our society. We have learned to wink at sin and just, just lay back and accept it and say, well, that's just the way it is. But listen, the Bible tells us it, not be, it ought not be that way. But in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, down in verse number 7, the Bible says this, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Now, not only as I believe this is fitting for a, church, for a body of believers, for an assembly of believers, but I believe it's befitting to an individual Christian. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. You say, what are you talking about? Listen, that sin, that, that leaven is a type of sin in the Scripture, that sin that is there, he said, purge it out, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Can I tell you what's going to have to happen in order to get the world out of us? We're going to have to purge our hearts. We're going to have to be willing to get rid of those things, to purge it, to put it away from. But the problem is this today, people love their sin. They love Moab. They love Moab. Uh, we're going to look at one that, that loved Moab more, more so than what she did her mother-in-law. But people today love Moab. But now, so not only is it can still happen in wicked days, that means today that there's hope for God's people. We, sometimes we can feel hopeless. It's hard. You know, I, I know that when we, sometimes we can get to preaching in a big way about how easy it is to serve God and we can sing, oh, how I love Jesus and we can think everything's fine in here. But when we go out there, it's different out there than it is in here. I do believe that's one reason why we need in here so much because of how different it is out there. But when you get out there, it's real living out there. When you get out there, the preacher's not around, the Sunday school teacher's not around, the deacons are not around. When you get out there, it's just you and God in the world. What's he say? He said, oh, you can do it, but you're going to have to purge out some things. You're going to have to get Moab out. You're going to have to get rid of Moab. All right, but second thing, there's a deciding factor that you've got to put in the equation. There's something that has to be put in the equation to even make it possible. And in order to know what's in the deciding factor, we're going to have to fast forward in the story a little bit. We're going to have to get out of chapter one. We're going to have to move over in chapter number two. And in chapter number two, it shows us the deciding factor. It shows us the fundamental principle that had to be in Ruth's life if she was ever not only to get out of Moab, but to get Moab out of her. You see, a lot of people can get out of Moab. 
But listen to what chapter number two says. In verse number 12, she's talking here to Boaz. And Boaz says this, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel. Look at this. Under whose wings thou art come to trust. You say, preacher, how was Ruth able to get Moab out of her? First of all, she put faith in the one that could deliver her out of Moab. Under whose wings thou art come to trust. This is a pivotal issue. This is, a, this is an issue that cannot be bypassed. We live in a, today, in a society today. We live in a world today where people are trying to omit this step. They're trying to get rid of the world. They're trying to be better people. They're trying to be better citizens. They're trying to be better Americans. They're trying to be better church members. But the problem is, is there's never been a day that they have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. That's step number one. And we're worried about works and we're worried about all kind of outward appearance. We're worried about all kind of things. And we major on the minor. I'm afraid so even in our churches. We major on the minor. We're more concerned with how people look on the outside than we are with what people are on the inside. I think it's important to look right on the outside. I think it's important to have a good testimony, maintain a, a, a sense of modesty, to be a good, a, a good shining light in a dark world. I believe all those things. But I'm going to tell you, all of those things are not going to get a person to heaven. None of those things are going to get people out of Moab. You can give them a suit, tie, a dress, and a King James Bible, but if they never put faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they're never coming out of Moab. They're never going to come out of Moab. They can, listen, you can conform them. By the way, Romans 12 was talking to people who have already been saved. You can conform them. You can, you can cram them into a mold. You can force them. You can shape them. Uh, you can you can try to uh, to try to uh, uh, to make them and what you want them to be. But unless they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they're never coming out of Moab. I'm convinced there's a difference between Orpah and Ruth. There's a difference. Now, or Orpah may have been she she may have put her faith and trust in Christ. She may I, I don't or, or in God, I, I don't know, but I know this. I know for a fact Ruth did. I know for a fact Ruth did. And that is a, that is a fundamental principle that must be had. Why, why would Ruth leave her home? Think about it for just a minute. You ever thought about the whys? You ever read the Bible and just wonder? Put yourself in their shoes? Why in the world would Ruth leave? There's some people around us who have never been out of the state. I can't fathom that. There's some people that, has anybody in here, how many of you lived in David County your whole life? Raise your hand. Lived in Davie County your whole life. Few of you. Few of you. Can't imagine living. This is Davie County is home. Davie County is home. I mean, it's home. Davie County is home. I'm not leaving Davie County. I'm not leaving. What would it take to get you to leave? I ain't leaving. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. Well, you don't, maybe, you don't think that maybe she liked her house too? You don't think that maybe, you know, lost people enjoy where they're at for the most part? They like living that life. That's the only life they know. They're comfortable. They're living for themselves. They're making decisions that, that, so, that, that focus solely upon them. But what would make her leave her home? Hey, what would make Ruth go with her mother-in-law? That's a question. I'm glad Charity didn't say amen. You didn't finish it, but you started it. It's all right to laugh a little bit. What would, what would make her go with her mother-in-law? What would make her choose? She left her family. Now, the Bible never mentions her family, but somewhere along the line, she had a mom or daddy somewhere. She got here. Somewhere along the line, she had a family. She had a home. She had, she had all of this stuff before Malon and Chilion ever come to town. She was there in Moab. What would make her leave Moab? Hey, let me get, what about this? What would make her leave her traditions? Man, that's a scary word among independent fundamental Baptist traditions. You can preach on a lot of stuff, but preacher, don't be messing with our traditions. Don't be messing with our traditions. I mean, we've been doing this since Dr. So-and-so did it this way, and because he said it, that's, don't be messing with our traditions. Well, why do we do what we do? What would make her leave her traditions? They had, they had traditions. They had cultural differences. Moab was drastically different than Israel. What would make her leave her gods? And her religion. 
What is it that would make her do that? Uh, listen, it's simple. Uh, when we come to the place she had put her faith and trust in the God of Israel, the God that she got to know because of, uh, because of Naomi and because of her husband, because of their children, because of that heritage, she put their faith into the one and the true God. And that changed everything. Can I tell you, our salvation ought to change everything from that moment on. From that moment on, it's impossible to get Moab out of you without, first of all, allowing God to bring you out of Moab. The first thing that a person must focus on in their life is not their deeds, it's in whom have they placed their faith. It's worth noting there's two important women in the story I just told you, but Ruth and Orpah. Ruth 1.10, listen to what both women say. In Ruth chapter number 1, verse number 10, read it with me. And they said unto her, they said, Ruth and Orpah both responds to Naomi. She said, go back home. Go back home to your families. And they said, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Surely we will. You know what they said? We're going with you. We promise we are going with you. Surely we'll go with you. Both of those girls said that, or those women. Both of them said, surely we will go with you. Yet in verse number 14, you know what we find? We find Orpah kissing everybody goodbye. She's going back home. Didn't take a whole lot of persuasion for her to go back home. I'm afraid today there's too many people that say they're Christians that it's not taking a whole lot of persuasion for them to go back to the things of the world. Not taking a lot of persuasion. It don't take but one person offending them and man, they're gone. One person, if one preacher not doing things the way, exactly the way they think that it ought to be done, and man, they just chunk it all. Let me tell you, the problem with them is not the preacher. The problem with them is they've never got Moab out of their heart. So preacher, well, what if you mess up? Pretty good chance I will. I made the same stuff you are. And I can work with you if you can work with me. Man, Moab. Moab's tough, but it didn't take much to get her back to Moab, did it? Surely we're going to go with you. Oh, we're never going. I'm going to stick with you to the end. Won't you go back? Okay, I believe I will. And she was gone. She left and went back. There is a difference between religious talk and genuine faith. Our land knows much of religious talk. A lot about religious talk. I'm, especially this part of the country, man. We know a lot about religious, about religious talk. We... But let, let's, let's separate that a little bit. Let's, let's get down to where we're really at. Because it's easy for me to preach against other denominations. It's easy for you to listen to me preach against other denominations. But I'm not another denomination. I'm an independent Baptist. And I'll say this. Among independent Baptists, there's a lot of religious talk. But there's a difference between religious talk and genuine faith. Why is it that people can walk away so easily? Because there's a difference between religious talk and genuine faith. Why is it that people could just, well, I'm not talking about just walking away from church, but to walk away from God because there's a difference between religious talk and genuine faith. Again, why would Ruth, why would Ruth leave and Orpah return? I believe both of these ladies are pictures of sinners. Verse, verse number four, they were both women of Moab. They had the same background, had the same upbringing in the same society, in the same culture. They were both women of Moab. Every sinner's from the same situation. They all have sinned. You say, well, preacher, wait a minute. It was, it, was, it was easier for Ruth to go because she didn't have roots. Oh, no, they were both women of Moab. Every individual that's ever been saved are both children of this world. They're all children of this world. Uh, we, we were rooted. We were born in the same mess, inherited the sin nature of Adam. Every one of us is the same. So well, why is it easier for one the other? could be with their relationship. Second of all, the impact and the importance of sharing the good news in a wicked land. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people. So they were women of Moab, but they heard that the account of Scripture uh, uh, that, the, that the Lord had visited his people, but they heard that in Moab. Church, listen, we're still in Moab. We better get to telling people the good news that there's somebody that can bring them out of Moab and he's got a better plan for them. Even, though, even now, they faced a choice. Each one of them. They're either going to stay or they're going to depart. Then she arose, verse number six, with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. So the choice was theirs. They had a decision to make. Am I going to go or am I going to stay? Now we're talking about getting Moab out of you, but you're going to have to get out of Moab. Should I go or should I stay? The choice both of them faced. Last thing, how can you tell if Moab's really out of you? 
Is there, is there evidence if Moab's really out of it? I believe there is evidence. I believe there's plain evidence in the book of Ruth, chapter number one and chapter number two, really through the whole rest of the book. You know, the, the potential, I love the potential of hope that this scripture gives us. When you look at Ruth's answer to Naomi, who's encouraged her to return, by the way. Naomi was not what you'd call a motivational speaker. You understand that Naomi was bitter. Naomi wasn't in any shape to help these girls spiritually. She wasn't in any shape to give, to give biblical, godly counsel to these young ladies that she was now responsible for. She wasn't in any shape. Why? She's bitter. She'd lost everything she had. She was bitter. She's probably mad at God. She's probably mad at her husband for bringing her to this stinking Moab. She's probably mad at her two sons, mad at God because her two sons were gone. She was, the Bible said she herself admits she's bitter. Went out full and he, the Lord's brought me again empty. She's trying to talk them into going back to Moab. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a pastor's wife saying, listen, don't serve God. It's just not worth it. You just need to go and live your life and die. In essence, that's what she was saying. That's exactly what she was saying. Just go back to Moab. Go back to your people, but listen to this, and to your gods. Child of God, it's serious business how we direct people in their lives. What we're telling them in essence when we're running down the house of God and when we're running down the things of God and we're mad and we're disgruntled, what we're telling the lost ear is, listen, you don't want anything to do with this. Just go live your life and don't bother with this. Go back to your people and go back to your gods. That's what Naomi told them. And in spite of Naomi's counsel, Ruth said, oh no, I'm going with you. You say, why is that? Because I'm convinced of this, that there was something in, in Ruth that not only had she, did she want out of, of Moab, but she was ready for Moab to be out of her. How do we know Moab's out of her? First of all, she never looked back. She never looked back. I, I don't ever see in, in the scriptures, in the book of Ruth, where she ever looked back to Moab. I don't see it. I don't see in the scriptures that she ever turned around and she longed for the day that she'd come back to Moab. Now, she was flesh. She was made of the same stuff and there might have been days that, uh, that she walked through and she thought about maybe mom and dad or maybe she thought about mama and papa or she thought about something and, and she loved her family, no doubt. I don't know where they were. I don't know if they abandoned. I don't know what the story was. But I never see that she longed to go back to Moab. She never looked back. She seemingly had no ties that she was holding on to. Can I ask you, child of God, what, what is it that we're clinging to? What part of the world won't we turn loose of? What part are we holding on to that we're clenching, that we're afraid to let go of, or we just refuse to let go of? Family, friends, money, career, fortune, fame, a certain lifestyle. Listen, what is what, what part of the world are we clinging on to? We've been delivered from it. Why are we still holding on? How do I know that she was delivered from Mo, uh, that, that Moab had gotten out of her? She never looked back. Go back to your gods. I'm going with you. Go back to your life. I'm going with you. Go back to Moab. No, I'm going to Bethlehem. Jew. I'm going with you. She never looked back. She never looked back. Man, decide to go forward. I, I may have given this illustration before. I've read it before. But it said that in 1519, a Spanish explorer named Hernan Cortez reached the Mexican border. Y'all heard the illustration? He reached the Mexican border. He was exploring. Upon arrival, he was, he, was a, he was a Spanish explorer. Upon arrival, he ordered all the ships destroyed but one. He sent that one ship back to Spain to give word. You know why he did that? You know what he said? When he, when he got, to, when he got to, the, to, the, to the Mexico border and he got there and all the men and everybody got off the ship and he, and he decreed that all of those ships but one would be destroyed and it said that he burned his whole fleet. You know why he did that? He said that way they could never go back. That way they can never go back. You know what would be good? It'd be good if we'd burn some ships. It'd be good if we decided, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna burn every opportunity that I ever have to go back. Why? Because I never wanna look back and allow Moab to creep back in. Decide not to retreat. Listen, the Moabites were no longer her crowd. How do I know that, how do I know that Moab was out of her? Because they weren't her crowd anymore. They weren't her crowd. Isn't it amazing how that God's people sometimes don't, have the right crowd. I'm not talking just teenagers. And here, here's a, let me give you an epiphany. Y'all ready? Those, those of you that have children living home, their crowd is usually going to be who you allow their crowd to be. 
That's generally who their crowd's going to be. Now I know as they get older, they can get rebellious and make friends at school and do things. Uh, but listen, they don't have to go to sleepovers. They don't have to go all this. If you don't know who they are, I'm not against that. Knock yourself out. Just know where they're going. Just know whose house they're staying in, what they believe, what they, what they, where they go to church. Do they go to church? But what about us as God's people? What about us as adults? Who's our crowd? Who is it? Who is it that we would rather be around? Would we, would we, would we rather spend time around God's people or would we, would we rather spend time with the world's people? That's really where, how you're going to determine who your crowd is. That, this is not profound. This is not something that's like, you know, I never really thought it that way. This is pretty simple stuff. Who is it that you would rather be around? She said, go back to your people, Ruth. Go back to your people. Here's really what sparked, sparked my whole, whole thought of the message is when she said this. Uh, he said, I, she said, I entreat thee, verse number 16. Uh, uh, Ruth said, rather, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And whether thou lodgest, I will, got, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy people shall be my people. She said, I want to be around that crowd that you've told me about. I want to be that, around that crowd of, in Israel around God's people. I, want to, I don't want to be around the Moabites. I don't want to be around the enemies of God. I don't want to be around the wickedness of land. I want to be around your people. I want to be around your God. How do I know that Moab was out of her? They wasn't her crowd anymore. They just wasn't her crowd. Some of you know what it's like. You, you know, you did have a life before you got saved. Usually people that get saved in their adulthood, they change crowds quick. You can hear their testimonies. People that's gotten saved later on in their adulthood, maybe in their early 20s or 30s or 40s or even 50s. You know what, what, I, what I found out? Their crowd usually changes. They've run with that one crowd for a long time, but their crowd will change once they get delivered out of Moab. You know why? They don't have desire. They, they're not looking back, but their crowd changes. There's some concern when our crowd doesn't change or when our crowd changes back. When our crowd changes back, thy people shall be my people. If you want to know if Moab's really out of you, look at your crowd. Look at who you're comfortable around. Uh, we, we were talking, we were laughing yesterday. And, uh, you know, I, for those of you that's been around here, I'm just who I am. I'm just me. You say, well, preacher, I don't like that. You, then you, it's, you probably at the wrong place because I'm just who I am. But I, I enjoy life. I, I enjoy it, man, I pick and cut up and laugh and sometimes it might be at your expense and sometimes it might be at my expense. Not to be ugly, but we just carry, I mean, I, I enjoy life. But let me tell you who I want to be around. I want to enjoy life with God's people. Amen. With God's people. Listen, I like to ride motorcycles, but you know who I ride, motor, ride motorcycles with? God's people. I do. I, listen, if, if I like to go on vacation. I like to, We do things with God's people. I like to eat. Most of the time, we eat with God's people. You say, wait, why do you, what do you say? I'm saying that's my crowd. That's my crowd. That's the people I want to be around. Uh, I, I'm, un, I'm uneasy around people that, man, it, you, you wonder what they're going to say. You, you, you know, you're wondering, okay, am I going to have to take a stand and say, listen, please don't talk, talk around me like that. I don't, I don't appreciate that kind of language. You know, I wonder what they're going to have to order. I'm not, that's just not my crowd. I want to be around the people of God. You know how, now listen, I'm not telling you I don't have my own struggles. I got my own struggles just like you. And if we're not careful, we can allow ourselves to become comfortable to a whole lot of things that we think I didn't used to be comfortable around. But who's our crowd? Who's our crowd? I don't understand, and I'll give you this, and this is, this is a little Chrisology I'm going to lay on you. I don't understand how God's people can never have a, have a desire to be around God's people. How could a Christian never have a desire to be around other Christians? If we'll understand the vitality of the early church, when they assembled together, their assembly meant something. It meant it wasn't just to fill time because they didn't have anything better to do on a weekend. It wasn't just because they knew that Peter was going to get to preach up and preach against them if they didn't show up at the assembly. Do you, you understand that this world was against them? This world was not their friend. They were facing real persecution. They were going to be scattered. They were going to have to leave their homes. And the only people that they had in this world to find comfort and to find encouragement and that they can, they can encourage one another was with God's people. And therefore, they assembled together. Why don't people today love the assembly? I'm, I'm convinced of this because it's not their crowd. 
They're, too, they're way too comfortable back in Moab. Oh, they'll, they'll, they'll come. They can, they can kind of intermingle with both crowds. They can kind of fit in everywhere. That's a problem. I, I believe this. I do believe we ought to kind of stick out like a sore thumb. Listen, I'm not telling you to kick down the door at work and go in and start preaching the gospel and wear your tie and carry your King James Bible, the, you know, your family Bible so that everybody knows. If, if you got to do that to get them to know, then you're not doing something right. But we ought to stick out. We ought, we ought to stick out. Why? They're not our crowd. We got to be around them. And if we're ever going to impact them, we got to be intermingled with them. And I'm going to tell you, they're, they're not my crowd. That's not the crowd I want to be with. How do you know that she, that she was, Moab was out of her, it wasn't a crowd. I like this also, she was also independently determined. Did you hear that? Independently determined. Well, preacher, nobody will help me. Her own mother-in-law said, you need to go back to your people and your gods. She said, you don't belong here. You don't fit in, you don't look like us, you don't act like us, and you'd probably be better off. You'd probably be happier just staying in Moab. You know what it took for her to overcome that? She had to be independently motivated. How do you know that? Well, look what the Bible says back in Ruth. The Bible said, and when she, talking about Naomi, saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Can you picture bitter Naomi? Can you, can you picture her for just a minute? You, you kind of look at her, looking at her, down at her daughter and I'll say, I can't tell her nothing. Fine, do what you want to do. Fine, go ahead. You'll see. You're going to get over to Israel. You're not going to like it like you think you're going to like it. It ain't all what you think it's going to be. I mean, I left and there wasn't no bread. And I know that God's blessing over there, but you're probably better off just staying mo. You don't know what's over there. Can I tell you something? She was steadfastly minded. She was, she was self-determined. I'm, I'm getting out of Moab and I want Moab out of me. She said, I'd rather be over there than I would be right here. I'm going with you whether you like it or not. I'm coming. I'm coming. Nothing you say is going to change my mind. Can I tell you something, child of God? We got to get to the to the place in our life where we can honestly say, no, nothing this world's going to say is going to change my mind. I want out of Moab, and I want Moab out of me, and be independently determined. I want to close with this last thought, and I'm done. One of the greatest things about not only getting out of Moab, but getting Moab out of you, is that God has something much better in store. God has something much better in store. I'm not talking about a health and wealth prosperity gospel. You know, I, I really don't understand that crowd. I don't understand if they'll study the lives of the disciples and the apostles. What much health, wealth, and prosperity? I was reading, I was reading. Uh, I believe it's John 21 about what Christ told Peter about how he was going to die. Uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't all a wonderful life ahead that he was just going to have great things and wealth and fame and fortune. Listen, he was going to suffer, but God had better things ahead for him than fishing. God had much better things than him from fishing. He said, follow me. Much better things than fishing. Can I tell you, God had a better plan over in Israel that she'd never been than Moab, which is the only thing she'd ever known. Can I tell you something, church? Listen to me. I know this world is the only thing we've ever known, but can I promise you this? God has something better if we'll get out of Moab and get Moab out of us. People are so afraid to surrender to the Lord. They're so afraid to find the will of God. And listen, it's, it's not a, a, a glorified hard, difficult thing to get a hold of. God wants you to know His will. God wants you to know His plan. God wants you just to simply follow. Just to simply obey. But God's got a much better plan. From chapter 2 all the way through the end of the chapter, we read the love story and the life-altering accounts of Ruth and Boaz. Ruth and Boaz. Everything good that was getting ready to come in Ruth's life was because of the influence of her kinsman. Everything good was because, you say, well, preacher, it was good because of God and God put Boaz, I, I got it, okay? Don't be so spiritual, come back and get a hold of this. Boaz is a type of Christ. Everything good in Ruth's life was because of Boaz. You understand that the, the person that God was going to give her was a person that was had need of nothing. He had servants, he had money, he had fields, he had lands, he had houses. He had need of nothing. And God was going to give her to Boaz. And God was going to give Boaz to her. And that we're talking about the grace of God. Brother Barker was talking about Ruth being a book of grace. That's the grace of God. But had she never left 
Moab. She would have never known God's goodness in the land of Judah under a man by the name of Boaz. But I'll say this. If Moab would have never gotten out of her, I believe she would have robbed herself of the blessing of coming to know Boaz. Everything hinged upon her relationship with Boaz. Her greatest life was ahead of her. It was all found and fulfilled in relationship with her kinsman and redeemer. If we would honestly evaluate ourselves, I wonder where we'd find out if we were really to ask the question and say, I know that I've been led out of Moab, but is Moab really out of me? And if it's not, if you can see the evidence that, man, the world's still lingering around, there's still a longing, and there's still something I'm holding on to, why don't we just take care of it this evening? I promise you this, the best is on the other side. God has better things in store than you can imagine by holding on to your Moab. I want you to stay.